Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes, as today we look at Alma 13 to 16. There's a lot of times when I prepare to give, whether it's this video or to prepare for a lesson, I always ask, why are these things being written? What's the background? Why does Alma choose, seemingly in the middle of nowhere, to include a chapter on a topic that seems to be not related? That's where I started off today, and I had to search because I had forgotten the, where this quote was, but I found this quote that you've probably maybe heard from the Prophet Joseph Smith. I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire, what was the question that drew out the answer or caused Jesus to utter the parable? Now, I'm altering this just a little bit. I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire. What was the question which drew out the answer or caused Alma to teach about high priests and the pre-earth life? Because that's Alma 13. And to me, sometimes it just seems out of place. It's a beautiful chapter and I love it. But why does Alma put it there? What's the connection? Well, there's a big theme in Alma chapter 11, 12, and 13. And just going back to last week with Alma 11 and 12. The doctrines that were taught there were nature of God and resurrection and the judgment and repentance and the plan of redemption and all those doctrines, you ask, why is he teaching it? Well, at the end of chapter 12, he gives a kind of repetition. Here's why. Therefore, whoever repenteth, harden not his heart, shall claim on the mercy through mine only begotten Son, unto remission of his sins. And then, hey, here's the reason why I guess remission of sins could be a part of it, but that these may enter into my rest. And if you don't repent and have that remission of sins, you will not enter into my rest, in verse 35. And then 37, let's repent at the very end, but let us enter into the rest of the Lord, which is prepared according to his word. Why is he teaching these doctrines? To prepare us to be in the presence of God. The prophets understand this. Moses taught this plainly. Here's my purpose of why I'm teaching you what I'm teaching. Now, this is from Doctrine and Covenants, section 84. Now, this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not, once again, enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the, floor, is the fullness of the, his glory. And a couple of verses in, before that, in verse 20, it links being in the fullness of his glory to the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood and God's rest. All that's linked. You want to be able to be in God's rest? You get there by participating in the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood. To enter into the order of the Son of God is the equivalent today of entering into the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is only received in the house of the Lord. So how do we enter into God's rest? And as I searched these chapters, I found a few things. I just find it's pretty simple. Really? God has put people on the earth to bless us, to help us into his rest. They're authorized servants today, and they teach us. And it's really simple. For us, we just accept the commandments, the things that are taught by the Lord's authorized servants, that we too might enter into his rest. And I do a little side note here, maybe you call it a scripture chain, because there's an attitude that God has about commandments that is really good to re be reminded of. Because for God, he sees commandments as something that inspire us towards entering his rest. He sees them as commandments, as having the power, or giving us power to be able to enter in God's rest. Obedience to the commandments bring rewards. The obedience to God's commandments bring blessings. And in verse in section 59, verse 4, I love one of the blessings he mentions is, hey, if you are obedient to God's commandments, I'm going to give you blessings. And one of the blessings is more commandments, not a few. And with revelations in their time. Because for God, his attitude towards commandments is they are a privilege to have. God's commandments are designed to bring us back into the rest of our Heavenly Father. I love the analogy that commandments are a lot like a string on a kite. 
The kite may turn to the string and say, You're tying me down. If I could just cut you, I would fly way, way up. But we've all who've uh, flown a kite know that if you cut the string, the kite soon falls. Commandments are the things which elevate us in our lives. And so I, as I go through chapter 12 and 13, I'm looking at, okay, what was the doctrine taught? And why? What's the end result? So we did Alma 11 and 12, and we looked over those scriptures. The reason why? To enter into God's rest. Chapter 13, there's doctrine taught about the premortal life and high priests. And then chapter 13, verse 6, at the end, the why? That they, these people who are taught the commandments, may also enter into his rest. 13, 10 through 12, we're just going to keep the theme here. You can guess, end of verse 12, that these people are made pure and enter into the rest of the Lord. And verse 13, those who are humbled and bring forth fruits of repentance are also entering into that rest. Another doctrine, and then the end of verse 16, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. Some more doctrine, and you got it. Verse 29, I know you're seeing this pattern. Having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that ye may be lifted up the last day and enter into his rest. It is a great reminder that the prophets want us to be in God's rest. The rest of the Lord, where mortals are concerned, is to gain a perfect knowledge of the divinity of the great latter-day work. President Joseph F. Smith said, It means entering to the knowledge and love of God having faith in his purpose and in his plan, to such an extent that we know we are right and that we are not hunting for something else. We are not disturbed by every wind of doctrine or by the cunning and craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive. It is rest from the religious turmoil of the world, from the cry that is going forth here and there, lo, here is Christ, lo, there is Christ. The rest of the Lord in eternity is to inherit eternal life, to gain the fullness of the Lord's glory. And I love this quote uh, from 2012 from Elder W. Craig Zwick. From this we understand that in this life the rest of the Lord comes as we increase our knowledge of and faith in the reality of Jesus Christ, even to the assurance that he lives and loves us. The rest of the Lord in eternity is entering into the presence of the Lord. In mortality we can receive a testimony of Jesus Christ in our hearts and enter into the rest of the Lord as we learn and teach the gospel. We can know in whom we trust as we follow the counsel of our prophets and priesthood leaders, honoring their and our foreordained roles, callings, and priesthood responsibilities. As we do, our fears will be removed and we will walk uprightly before the Lord. We will feel the deep spiritual peace that will give us a perfect brightness of hope. Then, when we stand before the Savior to be judged of Him, it will be according to our works, according to the desires of our hearts. If we are faithful, we will rejoice in the magnificent blessings of the Savior and His atonement, entering into His rest and presence. Really, that's what we want, to be back in the presence of God, and we are so blessed with commandments and authorized servants that help us back there. Alma chapter 13 also talks about foreordination. I love just starting off with a couple quotes I want to share with you, starting off with Prophet Joseph Smith. Every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained for that very purpose in the Grand Council of Heaven before the world was. I suppose I was ordained to ordained this very office in that Grand Council. President Kimball said, In the world before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments, while faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood tasks. While we do, do not now remember the particulars, this does not alter the glorious reality of what we once agreed to. Sister Dalton's great quote, You are to the young women, you are young women of great faith. You brought your faith with you when you came to the earth. Alma teaches us that in the premortal realms you exhibit exceeding faith and good works. You fought with your faith and testimony to defend the plan that was presented by God. You knew the plan was good, and you knew that the Savior would do what he said he would do because you knew him. You stood with him, and you were eager for your opportunity to come to earth. You knew what was going to be required of you. You knew what was going to be required of you. You knew it would be difficult. And yet you were confident not only that you could accomplish your divine mission, 
but that you would make a difference. You are choice spirits who are reserved to come forth in the fullness of times and take part in laying of the foundations of the great Latter-day work, including the building of temples and the performances of ordinances therein. Now, a great visual thing to think about. And I love this is from Sister Wendy Nelson. It's from a um, time when President Nelson and Sister Nelson were giving a devotional to the worldwide youth. Now, this is uh, June 3rd. 2018. And she asks a question. So let me ask you a question. What were you born to do? How I wish you could watch a 10-minute video of your pre-mortal life on YouTube. Now I pause there. Wouldn't that be awesome to watch a 10-minute video of your pre-mortal life? I think you would appreciate and see yourself more like God does. Back to the quote. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that if you could gaze into heaven for five minutes, you would know more on a topic than if you studied it all your life. So just imagine if you could gaze 10 minutes at your premortal life. Of course, we realize that the Lord has wisely drawn a veil over those memories. But just for a moment, imagine the effect on your life right now if you're permitted to watch 10 minutes of your premortal life. I believe if you could see yourself living with your heavenly parents and with Jesus Christ, if you could observe what you did premortally and see yourself making commitments, even covenants, with others, including your mentors and teachers, if you could see yourself courageously responding to attacks on truth and valiantly standing up for Jesus Christ, I believe that every one of you would have the increased power, increased commitment, and eternal perspective to help you overcome any and all of your confusion, doubts, struggles, and problems. All of them. I believe that if you could remember who you said you would help while you were here on the earth, or what anguishing experiences you agreed to go through, and whatever really tough situations you were presently in, or will be in, you would say, Oh, now I remember. Now I understand. This difficult situation makes sense to me now. With the Lord's help, I can do this. What a great quote. Because sometimes we are presented with difficult situations. Sometimes we are given a big burden. A burden that we may say, that is beyond what we can carry. These burdens are there. And as we switch gears with uh, Alma and Amulek, they are given a great burden. After they're done preaching, they are quite rejected. They are taken, and their wives are brought, and their children are brought together. Anybody who isn't taught to believe, and you know they're brought together, that they should be cast in the fire. And they brought their records, scriptures, that they can be cast in the fire can be burned and destroyed. And sometimes we wonder, here are some good people who are trying to do the right thing and they're going to pay the ultimate price. Why? We find many people critical when a righteous person is killed, a young father or others taken from a family or, bit, or violent. Some become bitter when off-repeated prayers seem unanswered. Some lose faith and turn sour when solemn administrations by holy men seem to be ignored. But if all the sick were healed, if all the righteous were protected, and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled, and the basic principle of the gospel, free agency, would be ended. Should all prayers be made according to our selfish desires and our unlimited understanding, then there would be little or no suffering, sorrow, disappointment, or even death. And if these were not, there would also be an absence of joy, success, resurrection, eternal life, and godhood. That's from President Kimball. Why are they wanting to burn them other than just be mean? Part of what they're doing for these righteous men and women, women and, and Amulek watch it, is they're mocking the doctrine that Alma and Amulek have taught. Mocking the doctrine that one day the wicked will go into fire and stone. Maybe that's why they say this to Alma. It came to pass when the bodies of those who had been cast in the fire were consumed, and also the records which were cast in with them. The chief judge of the land came and stood before Alma and Amulek as they were bound, and he smote them with his hand upon their cheeks. And now after what you have seen, will you perish again unto this people, that they, that they shall be cast into a lake of fire? In other words, 
we're not going to be the ones that are cast in the fire and brimstone because of what you call us being wicked. We're going to make it so you're part of the fire. That's what happens to you and your believers, not us and people who believe like us. Now, you do have Ezraim, who is just sick over what's done. His path, really, to change of heart and coming back into really accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, he starts being an, um, just a brilliant lawyer. He attempts to twist the words of Amulek to be able to, to catch him. He ends up getting caught in that man. He becomes stricken with a fever. Grief and guilt are his companion. And Elder Bednar has said, Guilt is to our spirit what pain is to our body. Of danger and a protection from additional damage. So for Zizram, he's there with guilt. And then Alma and Amulek find him alive. And he is, seeks to be uh, healed because of his faith in Jesus Christ. He's then baptized and he helps preach the gospel. It's an interesting path. One comment on Zizram's path and Oaks is that when we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must trust in him. We must trust him enough that we are content to accept his will, knowing that he knows what is best for us. Faith, how strong it is, cannot produce a result contrary to the will of him whose power it is. We cannot have true faith in complete trust in the Lord's will and in the Lord's timing. I think for Zizram, there must be a little bit of faith in the timing as well. But really, the faith is in Jesus Christ. Now, I add one other thing, because to Ammonihah, the Lord gives many witnesses. He gives Alma, and then he brings his companion Amulek, and then says Zizram comes, and then the earthquake comes, and shakes, and really is another witness of God. The same can be applied to us, to me. I have found that in my life there are prophets like Alma that come and teach me. There are members of my ward and family who are so wonderful in strengthening me and are as a witness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many people who find their way back to God's restored truths, like an Amulek or a Zizram, no matter what their path. And sometimes there are things like earthquakes, witnesses of nature, that God uses to humble us, to bless us. I would encourage each one of us today to listen to the Lord's many witnesses in our lives. Now, just some ideas as you teach this chapter, um, or these, these few chapters. Uh, first, focus on the why the doctrine is being taught. It helps to understand the doctrine better. And it's great to ask the question, what were you born to do? I love the idea of Sister Nelson of having some ponder time. You'll picture it of you in your premoral life. Write down what you think you would have said to defend Christ, what you would have said to defend the gospel. What would you think God thought of you in the premoral life? There's also something to remember to teach is that there's hope for people to change. Whether it's an Amulek who had heard the voice, but maybe it was not. Or a Zezerm who, well, was actively opposing the Lord's will. And remember, the Lord gives us witnesses in our day to us. I hope you have a great week. as you, uh, And that this is a great supplement to what you're studying in the book of Alma. In chapters 13 and 16, any quotes that I use in my brother brotherrmiller.wordpress.com. So please use that. That's a great result or a great source to you. Have a great day. Bye.